right, I really like this series that we're in. It's called Chasing Carrots. And basically what this is, it's, it's five weeks, six weeks. We're talking about things that are dangled in front of us like carrots that gets our attention distracted away from the things that are important, those things of God. Tonight we're going to be talking about counterfeit comfort. Counterfeit comfort. This is one of the things that the world really wants us to buy into and Christianity to buy into that the more comfortable we are, the more successful we are. You can look around and you can see with people that have a lot of money, if you want to look at that, they have maybe power or maybe they have uh, social status or whatever. If you have that, then your, your life is comfortable and that's the most important thing in your life. Well, we're going to learn tonight that living in comfort while there is comfort that can, come, that can come from the Lord, but comfort that this world offers is very fleeting. And so if we're going through things in our life that's not very comfortable, we don't like it, well, hopefully I can open up our eyes to understand that the uncomfortable things that we're going through or will go through in our life is meant to be there for a reason. And so we live in a world um, that has this idea of living your best life. How many's heard that line before? I'm living my best life. Yeah. What, is it, what does that even mean? Does that mean everything is okay? That means that everything's in its place? Does that mean that I have no want, no need? What does living my best life actually mean? We say this from time to time here, your best days are ahead. Doesn't mean that you're living your best life. But what it does mean is that when God is in the mix, better days are going to come. They may not be perfect days. They may not be comfortable days. But they're better days because the Lord is in it. When you go to social media, if you're on you know, Facebook or Instagram or whatever social media uh, platform that you're using, you'll see it from time to time. You'll see, I'm living my best life. You look at the pictures, by the way. If you look at the images, you'll see things like, an image of a family night, there's a dinner pick, and you get somebody taking the picture of the, the family, everybody's smiling, everybody's having a great time. Maybe that's real, maybe it's not. Maybe it's the immaculate house, the house looks good. I mean, a lot of times I see that with, in social media, you've got reels, right? These reels are like short videos that you can look, we look at. We use reels a lot for City Well, so people can kind of see little bits of pieces of what's going on in our church. And our, and by the way, uh, wherever Jade is, putting those reels together for the church, taking time to do that, really great work between her and Emily on doing that and making it look really, really good because it lets the, the people know outside the church what's going on in the church. But a lot of times you'll look at social media and you'll look at people and you'll look at all these pictures and what you look at and what the perception or what the picture is telling you, the kids are happy, everybody's smiling, everybody's got matching clothes, especially around Christmas time because they, they pull out their pajamas that they pull out one time a year. It's got reindeers on it or whatever. You know, they all do the family pictures around that. Everybody that looks at those pictures, the portrayal is this family is really living their best life. They've got it really all together. I really want to be just like them. What did they do to get to where they are? There's actually a whole industry that will create a fake vacation for you if you want it. All you really got to do is send in your pictures and they will superimpose your picture into this beautiful background and you can publish that and everybody can look at you and look at your family and say, this is the perfect family. Oh my, my, well, what's behind that is not really real. We're talking about a counterfeit comfort tonight. I don't know, I've never really had fake family vacations. That's really never happened with us. We never really said, we're gonna go on a vacation and be like, psych, not really. We always do what we say there, but it's amazing how there are so many companies today that will superimpose pictures and videos. They will do whatever you want them to do to make you look in such a way that is acceptable to other people. We're gonna be talking about approval one night. Maybe we'll talk about this this next Wednesday night. We're talking about approval and being accepted by people. But let me just say this, in this series, we're gonna be talking about chasing carrots. We're gonna talk about counterfeit comfort, but anything that you and I chase after, 
more aggressively than we chase after God is simply idolatry. Think about it for just a minute. I know it's a little heavy. But anything we chase after more passionately, more determinably, anything more aggressively, if we chase that more than we chase God, then that becomes idolatry in our life. Now prove that to me. Well, we know in Scripture that God is a jealous God. We find this in Exodus, the 34th chapter, in verse number 14. But before we go there, what is really idolatry and what plays into this idolatry? You might be asking, well, is there idols in my life right now? Well, let me just explain what idolatry really is. It basically involves giving ultimate devotion, trust, and worship to created things instead of the Creator. So if, if the created thing has my devotion, it has my trust, and I worship it more than I do the Creator, then it can become an idol in my life. Now, it typically refers to the worship of physical idols. If you go back to the Old Testament, you'll see this all the time, right? They had all these idols that they would look to, and uh, there's several different ones that they would use in the Old Testament. We know that Moses came down from the mountain. He had the law, and you know what God did. He was very jealous of his people, and the whole story, ground swallowed him up, and all that happened. But idols is not just about a physical statue. Having an idol in our life is not literally about having this physical uh, statue that I look at, that I worship, and I adore, or I devote myself to. It can be anything that takes God's rightful place in our life. Now, this could be money, this could be power, this could be relationships, and it could be time. Where do we spend our time? We, do we spend our time more with things that is not of God than it is with God? Now, these are all things that we've got to think about. Exodus 34 and 14 says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is what? Jealous. Is, he is a jealous God. Now, when you think about jealousy... A lot of times you think of it in the physical sense of I'm jealous of that person or that person or that person. But in this sense, jealousy is simply he, the Lord, desires exclusive devotion from his people to him. Right? His jealousy reflects a deep desire for our faithfulness to him. Now, I'm going somewhere with this because there's... there's carrots that are dangled in front of us all the time that wants to get our attention and, and rightfully away from the thing that's important the most. So with that in mind, I want to talk about the pursuit of comfort. How many likes to be comfortable? Have you ever slept in a bed that's not yours and you know it's not the same? Like if I go somewhere and lay down on the bed somewhere, I'm probably going to get some good sleep. I have no problem sleeping, by the way. I will sleep through a storm, most likely. Uh, but there is no better place to sleep than in my own bed. I'm com most comfortable there right. in my own bed. I'm most comfortable with my own pillow, right? right? Go to a hotel, grab a pillow. It's not going to be the same. You see, there's a lot of false teachings and destructive lifestyles among Christians, no matter what our age is, that says the love of the world will bring us comfort. I'm going to break it down for you for just a moment. You're like, well, well Pastor, I've been in this thing a long time. What, what is, does this even matter to me? Yeah, I want, I'm going to show it to you for just a moment. The Bible says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him or her. So when we love the world system, we've we got to figure out what this world means. 17 times in John... He uses the phrase, the world. This was his first letter to the church. So what does the world not mean? So if we've got to figure out what it does mean, what does it not mean? So in my opinion, the word world that we're talking about tonight 
shouldn't be the people in the world. Because we're supposed to love the people in the world. But even our enemies, you have an enemy, you're supposed to love your enemy, by the way. So it can't be people, right? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't, we shouldn't enjoy the gifts that God has given us. For example, maybe God has given you a gift in a nice vehicle. Maybe he's given you a gift in a nice home. Maybe he's given you a gift and rewarded you in your retirement. I don't know what that gift is. Maybe it's a gift of health. Don't know what it is, but that doesn't mean that we're supposed to hate the gifts that God gives us that the world provides, right? right? Because every good and perfect gift we know comes from where? The Father above. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we should not love creation, right? Because the Bible says creation testifies to the glory of God. So I can look at the trees, I can look at nature, I can look at the beauty of what God has created, and I can love that because it reflects God, because God did it. But when you put it into the, uh, uh, contextually, it simply means the word, the world system, just simply means the cultural system of this world or the spirit of this world. That is what we are not to love. Now that's going to be different for everybody based on your beliefs, based on your conviction. And there's things in the word of God that will point everything out. But there are some things that you will have a conviction on that maybe somebody else does not have. Right. But what does this world system teach us? Look everywhere around you. Look within the political theater, what's happening with politics. Look in the school system. Look everywhere, and you're going to find that it simply means a life that does not need God. The spirit of this age, my age, your age, and when we're long gone, if the Lord does not return, and somebody else comes up below us, or next generation, is going to, it's still going to be the same. The world is going to teach that it's beautiful thing that you do not need God in your life. That's what the world system teaches. Now, no matter where you are in your journey of life, it's going to be hard to say this, but I think it's true. Everybody has a desire to have a life defined by ease rather than struggle. If you got down to the crust of it, you and I would rather have a life of ease than a life of struggle. Name one person in the Bible that you can think of that had a life of struggle. First person comes to your mind, Job. Who else had a life of struggle? David. You can go down the road again, the disciples. Think about what happened when the Lord left, the struggle that they had. Some were crucified, bold, upside down, all this kind of stuff. And, and so their life was a life full of struggle, affliction, the whole nine yards. We would rather have a life made of ease than we would have a life full of trouble. Why do you think that's the case? Well, I'm going to point out four quick things because we'll run out of time. The first thing we have to understand is that our human instinct is to survive. The basis of our instinct of humanity is to, to survive. So we are wired to seek comfort and to avoid pain or danger. Stranger danger. Talked that to my girls, all of my girls when we were walking, when they were growing up, when they get them outside the door and they were heading to the bus or heading to school, I'd say stranger danger. And they'd know exactly what that meant. Do not talk to strangers. We know that, right? And so it's the whole fight or flight situation response that we have when, when things come up <clears throat> that challenge us. So we're wired to seek comfort and to avoid pain or danger. The second one is there's influences in our life, whether it's the world, family, church, whatever. In many societies, success is often portrayed as living a comfortable lifestyle. Think about what you see on social media. You see the family chilling out in the, uh, on the seat, whatever, they're on the beach or maybe they're on the boat. It's all good. I'm living a life of ease. And people look at that. If your life is stress-free, then you're living a comfortable life. You don't want stress in your life. You don't want anxiety in your life. You don't want these heartaches. You don't need any of this stuff in your life. You don't want this. And so we can sometimes be programmed by what we see, hear, and experience to say, I would rather take the road less traveled 
the road of ease versus saying, Lord, I'll take the harder road because the harder road I know means trouble. And because the harder road means trouble, that means I'm going to be afflicted. That means I'm going to have heartache. That means I'm going to suffer. And my brain is telling me, don't want to suffer. We want it right. We want it easy. But in this life and in this walk with God, we always know the avoidance of hardship is never the road most traveled. You don't have to raise the hand for this, but if you're going through hardship right now, whatever that hardship may be, whatever you see today is this is not what I want to experience. We have to understand there is a reason for why we are hurting why we are going through the stressful situation, why we are on this road that's not a road of ease, but maybe a road that is a hard one. And the Bible tells us why he's putting us on this road, because there's joy that can come out of the hardships. But there's a counterfeit comfort that says, the world says, if you will do X, Y, and Z. I just saw this today. I was going through LinkedIn and I saw this little video that says, you can make a million dollars in 90 days. If you do this and this and this and this and this, you can make a million dollars. There's that kind of advice out there uh, all day long. Doesn't mean it's ever going to work. Maybe it does. Maybe it's not. But it's that type of thing. If you are looking at it, seeing it, watching it, listening, whatever, that influence that's in our lives says we must have a stress-free life. And if I have a stress-free life, then that is the type of life that is an ease. And if that's the way I'm going, then that's good. But that's not always the case. Because there is a fellowship with the Lord that we should have. And that fellowship is not always fellowshipping or seeing His glory. He's never going to share it with us. But there is also a fellowship of what? Suffering. There is a suffering that we go through so that we can experience, see, not share the glory that comes behind that. So if you try to avoid hardship, you might be avoiding the very thing that you need that the Lord's trying to help you with to get something out of you that needs to be out of you. The third thing real quick is the fear of suffering. What is the one thing that scares you the most? In our family, we talked about this one time. <clears throat> For one of the family members, it's being in a car, going over a bridge, going into the water, and can't get out of the car and drowning in the car. That's a fear. Mine, believe it or not, is like jumping out of a plane and the parachute doesn't open up. Like imagine that, you're seeing your death before, you know. So everybody has a fear of something. It could be a fear of taxes. It could be fear of death. There's all these fears that are out there, but there is a fear of, of suffering. And struggle is always associated, most likely associated with pain, loss, or discomfort. The fear of of the unknown and the fear of uncertainty makes people naturally seek out situations that minimize suffering and maximize pleasure. I talked about this last week. We become numb. There's things that we do in our life that we become numb to the things that we do not want to address. And therefore we are distracted and put our attention to the things that numbs those pains. I'll give you an example of this. It's not happening in our church, obviously, but if, if somebody is suffering or they're hurting or, or they're upset or they don't like what they're going through, a lot of people will turn to alcohol. It'll numb the process. Some people will go to drugs for those things. There's all these different outlets that people have. So the fear of suffering, first of all, I want you to know, is a natural thing. It's natural to feel that way. And the last one is the human desire, our desire for fulfillment. Believe it or not, there is a desire that we have to be fulfilled. And sometimes we equate that happiness or that fulfillment with ease. In other words, if I have an easy life, then I'm happy. If I'm happy, I'm fulfilled and everything is right until something comes along. See, there's this counterfeit comfort that comes our way that says, hey, you don't want to have the tough road. 
You don't want to take the road less travel where there's problems and there's situations. It's going to force you to your knees to pray. It's going to force you to reconsider your beliefs. It's going to force you to do the things that you know you need to do. Nobody wants to go down that road because there's a lot of soul searching that we have to do when we go down that road. We would rather sometimes go down this road of ease because it's simply that. It's easier. And so when struggles are removed, life seems to become more enjoyable. Think about this for a moment. Have you ever been tired and then you took a vacation? And when you come back from that vacation, you look rested. Have you ever felt that before? I felt that when we went on our last vacation. We left and went out and you know, just had a good time or whatever. <clears throat> and I came back, I felt rested. I felt good. Does that mean my problems went away? No, my problems were right here when I got back. Right? None of that stuff changed, but I felt a little more rested when I got back. But when I came back, I didn't say to myself, well, hey, I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to address the, those issues. I'm not going to look at those issues. I'm not going to pray about those issues. I'm not going to even look at those issues because if I do those things, then I'm going to have a little bit of anxiety about all that stuff that's out of my control. If I look at that, pray about that, put it, really put it in God's hands, maybe it would be easier for me just to ignore it and go this direction because if I ignore it and put it over there and just hope God takes care of it at some point, maybe this road of ease, it's counterfeit by the way, because this road of ease, this counterfeit road or this counterfeit comfort that sometimes uh, we, we tend to go down, what it in, ends up doing sometimes, <clears throat> it leads us down a very destructive path. Struggle and hardship are necessary for growth. Struggle or hardship, necessary for growth. That's right. Think about the job that you're in. If you're going to learn a new skill, it's going to be hard if you don't know what you're doing. You might feel a little bit inadequate. You might feel like, I don't have that skill. I'm having to learn a new skill. It's very embarrassing because I don't know what I'm doing. But that's the hardship, and that's the cost of learning, and that's the cost of growing. The Bible shows us several times that perseverance through trials can produce the strength and can produce good character. Why is it that the Lord talks to us and reminds us that His strength is made perfect in our weakness? It doesn't mean that He's going to remove the thing out of our path and so His strength is revealed. No, that's not what that means. He's not going to take us off the hard road and put us on the easy road and say, now you see my strength. No, no. What He's going to do is He's going to allow us to stay on that road that we don't want to be on, and we are going to make it through, and we're going to have strength because we're consistent. Matter of fact, the Scripture reminds us that we will reap in due season if we don't what faint. We will get the reward. We're going to reap it, but we can't faint. James 1 and 2 says this, 2 through 4 says, Brother, Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any kind comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Are you going through something that's uncomfortable right now? Are you dealing with something that you don't really like to deal with? Is God messing with your plans a little bit? Is He trying to do something in your life that maybe you don't really want Him to do with? Is He talking to you, making you feel a certain way about your walk with Him and it's very uncomfortable? There's joy in that. It's uncomfortable, but there's joy in it. The joy, the Bible tells us there's, great, there's an opportunity for great joy. This is New Living Translation. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to what? Grow. Well, in this scripture, endurance simply means, guess what? Strength. It means patience. It means resolve or durability. What the church needs in this hour that we live is more durability. The durability that says, when things don't go my way, the first thing that I check off the box is I'm not durable but, uh, with, with is attendance at church or getting involved in church or doing the things that pleases God. Just take the whole church out of it, the, the sanctuary out of it, but just doing the things that pleases God. I've seen several times people go through a trial and the first thing that they give up on is their service to the Lord. I don't know why it is that way. The first thing that they give up is their service unto the Lord. And why is that? Because that durability there, there's not enough strength. There's not enough, what's the word, elasticity? Is that the right word you say? Where It's like a rubber band. There's not enough of that. So when you're going through something that's really, really painful, we tend to get away from the, move away from the things that we might think be causing that. And so 
So let it grow. Let your strength grow. Let your patience grow. Let your resolve grow. Let your durability grow. All of that can grow when your faith is being tested. A faith that can be tested is a faith that can be trusted. If somebody is going through something that when everybody looked at them said, I don't know how they're making it through, but they come back to church every day, that the church doors are open, they're opening up their arms and they're worshiping God, they're getting involved even though the fire of trial is burning, that's the kind of faith that I trust is that kind of faith because it's past the test. And so James is telling us in 1 and 2 and 4, when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, guess what, needing nothing. In other words, I won't need your approval when I know I'm complete in him. I won't need your adoration when I know I'm complete in him. And you know what? I may not necessarily need your encouragement when I am complete in him. And so everybody here this this evening joining us online in person tonight, there is something that the Lord does really want to work out in our life. And so chasing this counterfeit comfort, you have a guide there tonight that, that we can follow along. You can, you can talk with it with your family, share it with somebody if you want to. But there is a, a, a word that we know as counterfeit. And basically what counterfeiting is, it's basically a close copy. It's a substitute for something that has value while the counterfeit has no value. Now, in my banking world, what I've been doing for 30 plus years, I see this all the time. I see counterfeit money all the time. You present me with a $100 bill, I might look at that $100 bill and I might say, that might look like it's real. But when I put it under the light, it reveals whether or not that is a real bill or not. And guess what we do? We don't give that money back to the customer. We have to, oh, I'm sorry, this is a counterfeit bill. Well, I did not know that. I'm sorry. The FBI tells us we can't give it back to you. We have to record that. See, something that's counterfeit under the right kind of light, under the right kind of test, under the right kind of fire, will reveal whether or not it is real, authentic, or counterfeit. Think about that for just a moment. A counterfeit says I have value, but it's a substitute for the real thing. And the counterfeit has no value. So what does counterfeiting comfort mean? What what does it mean if I'm chasing this comfort? In other words, if I'm chasing comfort, I'm running away from pain. I'm running away from something that I do not enjoy, something I do not like. I'm running away from that, and I'm chasing something that is not real. First of all, this counterfeit comfort will reveal over time spiritual emptiness. Think about it for just a moment. If we don't have him on the inside, we are running on empty. And we can only run so far. Paul said, I ran the race, right? I had kept the faith. I ran the race. I did the thing I needed to do. He was in prison penning that letter. He really had that authentic walk with God. But if we have a counterfeit walk with God, in other words, the walk with God that says, when I'm at the church, in front of people, people perceive I have this walk. But away from God is not the same. That has no value. And that will run out of gas over time. Because there will be a light, there will be a test, there will be something that will come our way that will reveal that this walk that we have is not authentic, that it is counterfeit. So it reveals spiritual emptiness. Do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's in 1 John. If I think about God's love towards the lost, what do I think about? I think God loves the Lord when he was on this, Jesus when he was on this earth. Where did he go? He didn't come for those that needed a physician, or he came for those that needed a physician. He didn't come for those that were well. He came for those that were hurting, poor, weak. He came for those people. He was the master physician. That's why he came. So when you think about God's love, Then we got to go to the scripture that says, for Christ's love compels us. That compel in the Greek just simply means holding together. For Christ's love compels or holds together us that those who live should no longer live for themselves, 
but for him who died for them and was raised again. Christ's love. So Paul is telling us here, he's expressing that the love of Christ exerts a powerful influence on him driving his actions. So, for example, if Christ's love compels me to do what's right, compels me to not live for myself, but to live for others, if Christ's love compels me to not only love, what is that compelling? It's Christ, his influence, the love that he has for us, his influence is on me, and because of his influence that is on me, it's driving my everyday actions, those actions that determine how I really feel for him. Paul says, it's his love that's driving my actions. It's nobody else. It's nobody. I'm not performing for anybody. I'm not having to meet anybody's expectations. I'm not trying to meet anybody's standards. I'm not trying to do any of that for anybody else. It's his love that I realize. Church, do we really understand that it was his love that nailed him to a cross? It was his love that took him to a grave, rose the third day, so that you and I might enjoy this relationship with him and be able to sit in this sanctuary today and be able to lift our hands without wrath and without doubt and say, Lord, I'm so thankful that you gave me this opportunity to sit in this chair in your sanctuary or in my home or wherever I'm at. God, if it wasn't for your love, I wouldn't be here today. Paul says it's that influence that he has on me that compels me and forces me to do the right things. So if I'm not doing the right things, is there something wrong with my view of his love for me? In other words, what am I looking to to provide that validation in my life? What am I looking to to provide that approval in my life? Because Paul says all I need is Christ's love. It compels me to do the things I need to do. So... <clears throat> The viewpoint that we should have, in my humble opinion, is that we see God as the treasure that he really is. So let me ask you, maybe jot this down somewhere. If you're, what does the Lord really mean to you? When you think about God in the context of a treasure, what does that treasure look like to you? And when you go to him, do you go to him, do we go to him as the fountain of living water? So in other words, he is the only source of our strength, water representing strength. And when we trust in him, we trust in him and know that he alone is enough. In other words, when I go to him with questions or prayer, read the Bible, things like that, it's enough. I don't need to take it to a committee. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't go to the multitude of councils where there is safety and ask questions and get some support. That's, that's not what I mean. But when we read his word and his word applies to our situation, that is enough. I don't have to go to a council. I, have to, I don't have to go to a committee. I don't have to sit down with multiple people to figure it out. Is this what it is? This is what it is. I'm praying. I'm reading his word. He's revealing it to me. This is enough for me. And then I realize that in his presence is fullness of joy. In other words, the fullness of joy that I need, the strength that I need, all of that stuff I need, I find in His presence. I don't get it from anywhere else. I get it from the true source. And so when we treat God as a treasure, and we look to Him as the fountain of living water, and we trust in Him as He being enough for us, and we see Him as His presence in, in his presence is fullness of joy. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Now, the first thing we talked about was counterfeit comfort reveals spiritual emptiness. The second thing that this counterfeit comf uh, comfort reveals is that it eliminates our need for faith. Because what it does, it makes us look to other things for validation. It makes us look for other things for comfort. It makes us look to other things to provide what we need versus truly having faith 
in God for the things that we need. By faith, Abel offered and killed the sacrifice. Noah convinced that the flood was coming even though there was no rain. Abraham left his home to occupy the promised land. Sarah believed she would conceive even though she didn't have a child and she was up in age when she actually did. Joseph on his deathbed spoke of the exodus of Israel from the Egyptian slavery. I mean, all of these things that we see throughout the Bible is not about the bed of ease. It's not the bed of roses that we hear about. It's not, in, it's not in the valley where we're just enjoying life. It's all of this stuff that we see in Hebrews 11, these, these heroes of faith, they saw the things that they saw because of not comfort, but because they struggled all the way through. Moses, even with his speech impediment, was still used by God to face down Pharaoh and deliver Israel. Think about that. A man that was handicapped, he couldn't even speak right. God used him. So none of these were easy things that these people in the Bible dealt with. None of them were easy. So let me ask you a question. Are you dealing with something tonight that's not easy? Are you dealing with something tonight that you feel like is out of your control? Are you dealing with something tonight that you feel like, I don't know if I can even wrap my arms around this. It's so big. I can't even begin to think where to start, <laughs> where to go, or how it's going to end. Well, you know what? You're in familiar company because Noah, all he knew what to do was take the instruction from the Lord and start building an ark. And everybody, in the, everybody around him thought he was crazy. But guess what? The Lord sent the rain. Moses, with the lack of speech that he had, had his friend next to him, Aaron, went before Pharaoh, went before an obstacle that to me, I don't have anybody, and I'm going before a Pharaoh that has hundreds and thousands, maybe millions of people. He could squash me like an ant, like, but I still go. That's a hard thing to do, to face a Pharaoh in my life, and I don't even know how to even talk to him. None of these people lived in comfort. And every one of them required faith in God to show up and do the impossible. You see? For the Lord to do the impossible is going to require us to believe that he can. For him to do the impossible is going to require us to believe that he can. That is saying simply something like this. God, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I believe it's in your hands. And Lord, you're going to work this out for my good. We don't even know what the good is, where the good's going to be. We don't know when the good's going to show up. Where is the good? It doesn't look good right now. It looks anything but good. But I imagine maybe Moses felt the same way. Maybe Noah felt the same way. Maybe Sarah felt the same way. So let me ask this question for you tonight. What part of your life are you helpless without God intervening? Think about that for just a moment. What part of your life are you helpless? helpless without God intervening. That one area in your life that if God does not come in and provide a miracle, it's all going to fall apart. I think we all have something like that that we're dealing about, dealing with. It may not necessarily be just relational. It could be internal. It could be family driven, work driven, financial. It could be all these different things. But the writer goes on to say, and without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He is or He exists and that He rewards those who diligently or earnestly seek Him. So I wrap that up to say this. We cannot pursue comfort and walk by faith. I think it's going to be very difficult to pursue this counterfeit comfort and then also walk by faith. Because the counterfeit comfort, excuse me, this counterfeit comfort is, has no value to it. It says it's full of value. You're going to live your best life. You're going to, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be beautiful. Everything's going to be right until something goes wrong. And then when it goes wrong, we're not ready. So what do we do? Well, we first have to learn how to identify the, the uh, the counterfeit.